episode of the William Branham Historical Research Podcast. I'm your host, John Collins, the author and founder of William Branham Historical Research at william-branham.org. And with me, I have my co-host, researcher, minister, and friend, Charles Paisley, the founder of ChristianGospelChurch.org. And together, we're examining the history and the intersections in history between William Branham and other key figures that either influenced or were influenced by the post-World War II healing revivals. Charles, I've said it the past few episodes, but I feel like now we're finally getting into what I consider to be the really, really interesting things. It's, you know, the background of what's going on behind William Branham's religious personality. Now we start to see coming to the surface in other areas. If we look at the timeline of events that is happening around what William Branham is saying in his sermons that most people just fully miss, because as you know, a large portion of message believers are are not allowed to be educated. Many of them are educated in cult-related or cult-influenced homeschool groups, etc., Um, I was one of the privileged children. I got to be in a public school, and I knew some of this history, but I'll be honest, even when William Branham's mentioning it, because we're listening to these sermons over and over and over, it kind of just all blends together, and you really don't piece together what he's saying with what are the current events. But as as you and I know, and as our listeners are going to find out during the course of this episode— Understanding what's happening around William Branham is very, very critical to understanding the decisions that he made and the quote unquote supernatural mysteries that he exposed, etc. And, you know, I, I'm like I say, I'm just fully, fully interested and excited to get into this show particularly. Yeah, you know, I, I think for me the most interesting thing from all of this is and I have to say interesting in a sad, shocking, and unfortunate way, uh, is learning the true history of Serpent Seed, where it came from, uh, what it meant from the people that William Branham learned it from. That that really is, for me, the most, as a a former message believer, the the great... The great takeaway from the things we're going to talk about today. So, really, we're we're continuing on in a lot of ways from our last episode. Um, Our last episode, we talked about British Israelism and how Christian identity got started among British Israelism. But today, I think we're going to talk about how um, the Christian identity movement developed out of the British Israelism and how it eventually found its way into uh, traces of it, into the Latter Rain Revival, and eventually into the message and and some of our other cousins of the Latter Rain movement, John. And uh, let me hold up for our listeners again right quick going into this, this book, this book is really a, a great place to start for anyone who wants to investigate this topic. It's called Religion and the Racist Right. A whole lot of what we've been talking about in this episode and the last you can find right in this book. It traces the history of British Israelism, the emergence of Christian identity theology, and again, just a, talks a lot about the exact same things we're going to talk about today with footnotes, sources where you can trace and, and dig deep into this stuff. So... I guess kind of starting out, um, Christian identity theology begins with a man named Philip Monson in the 1920s. And Philip Monson was a British Israelite preacher who became the father of Christian identity theology. And just a tiny bit about him, he was a preacher and a teacher at a seminary connected to the Angelus Temple in Los Angeles. And the Angelus Temple, that was the church of Amy Semple McPherson. And during the 1920s, it was one of the key hub churches of Pentecostalism. And from what I've read, John, uh, the Angelus Temple was the largest church in the United States at the time it was built. I I think I've got a picture here of the interior I can show. It was the largest church in the United States. It was certainly the largest Pentecostal church um, in the world uh, at the time. So it was was incredibly influential within, um, within Pentecostalism. And a, a key hub from which a lot of its beliefs uh, of Pentecostalism were spread. And it was just a few blocks away from where the Azusa Street Revival happened. And it it really had a lot of connections to Azusa Street. A lot of the people from Azusa Street ended up coming to their church after it was built. It was just a very influential 
church. And early Pentecostalism was, was deeply into British Israelism. British Israelism was publicly taught at the Angelus Temple and at their connected seminary. And so Philip Monson is teaching um, at that seminary connected to their church. And while he's there, he writes a book called um, Satan's Seat, The Enemy of Our Race. And that book is what historians generally agree to be the first formulation of Christian identity. And along with that book, he published a magazine. I got uh, just one of the covers of, of his magazine. It's a magazine called The Herald of Our Race. And he, he published quite a bit of material. Um, and it, it's fairly easy to get access to that, read it, and see exactly what his beliefs were. But he, he's the man who formulated Christian identity theology. And what he does in his book, John, and this is very, very racist, what he does in his book is, like British Israelism, he, he does say the non-white races are descended from the serpent, but there's two things that Monson does with the genealogy of the serpent seed for the first time in his writings. He uh, traces the serpent seed um, through Nimrod to Babylon, and he then connects it to the Catholic Church. And then he also connects the line of the serpent seed into the Jewish people, and he connects the Jews to the serpent seed. And he, he gets to the point where he decides the Jewish people are imposters, and the tribe of Judah are the true tribe of or the people of Germany are the true tribe of Judah. And so those are really the two key things that separate Christian identity theology from British Israelism, those that, that tracing it into the Catholic Church and into the Jewish people. Right. And I think, you know, many of our listeners have probably already seen, I think we've done some uh, brief mentions of it in our podcast, and I've put some into the video feed, but that exact theology spread throughout the latter reign, the quote-unquote mystery Babylon from Revelation. It was heavily used in propaganda, and to the average listener hearing it, they don't really realize that this is racist, because if you open the book of Revelation, you see mystery Babylon, and you see exactly you know, what these speakers are referring to, but all of the extra biblical things that they bring into those sermons, that's where you really have to examine because what they're bringing, what they're overloading that sermon to be is very, very racist. And there's no, there's really no denying it. If you look at William Branham's theology and just look at all of the mysteries that he quote unquote supernaturally revealed, you're going to find that no, they weren't his own invention. They came from the white supremacists, and he was actually siding with the white supremacists. Right. And so just kind of remember those two key details that Christian identity theology developed the belief that the serpent seed was connected to the Catholic Church via Nimrod and Babylon, and it also connected Jewish people to the serpent seed. That Those are two ideas that were born in Christian identity theology. Philip Monson was the was the developer of those ideas. And as we go on, we'll, we'll show some quotes. William Branham taught this. William Branham taught this. And so Philip Monson, as he's teaching at that seminary in Los Angeles, he creates um, that Christian identity theology in the 1920s, starts teaching it. And there's a strong Nazi connection as he's doing this, John. And honestly, I, I've as you go through some of these books, you'll find that as Hitler is giving his speeches, things that Hitler is saying, quotes and things are ending up in Monson's publications, right? right. Christian identity, in, in, in an honest way, is mixing Nazi ideology into British Israelism, and it is producing Christian identity, right? Like, there's, no, there's not even a question that that's what's happening here. Philip Monson is taking ideas from Hitler, merging it into British Israelism, and producing Christian identity theology. Yeah. And... Um, at the seminary where he's teaching, he has a student, and the student's name is Wesley Swift. And Wesley Swift is the man who goes on and he takes Philip Monson's ideas and turns them into the Christian identity movement. There's a picture of Wesley Swift, what he looked like. Um, and Wesley Swift, boy, I mean, we could talk just about for, forever about Wesley Swift, John, and all the stuff he did. But I'll, we'll just keep it to a short summary here. He's a really well-studied person. If you look him up, you'll find 
biographies, writings, again, just kind of refer to some of these books that we've pointed you to. But in summary, he was the Klegel of the Ku Klux Klan in California, Wesley Swift, and that would be the spokesperson of the KKK in California. He got really involved with the Nazis in the 1930s and the 1940s, in addition to the KKK, and became an important leader in the neo-Nazi movement. And he was spreading Christian identity theology everywhere he went. And he partners up with a man named Gerald Smith. I've got a picture of him here I can show you. Gerald Smith. Gerald Smith was probably the most prominent Nazi in the United States back in those days. Well-known Nazi figure. Um, he... I, I think he, he is easily the most well-known, most popular Nazi in the United States back then. And he's moving in all kinds of circles. And, and the two of them partner up and are moving together. He was a preacher too. And they're sharing and spreading this Christian identity theology all over the United States. Um, and another thing too about Wesley Swift, he was a member of the Anglo-Saxon World Federation, John. And... We know in those same years, in those same years that Wesley Swift was in the it was in the uh, Anglo-Saxon World Federation, Gordon Lindsay was actually organizing conferences for the Anglo-Saxon World Federation in the same years. Um, you know, it, this was a very strongly British Israelite group, and so it, it's entirely possible, John, that, and I think likely that Wesley Swift. And Gordon Lindsay were probably at some of these conferences together. I mean, it, it uh, to me, it seems, it's pretty hard for me to imagine a scenario where that's not probably true. They were spreading a new idea to the United States, and these men were basically congregating together. And remember, William Branham's early ministry was sponsored by the Kardashian family and Dima Shakarian, who basically rose up to be the founder of the Full Gospel Businessmen. They were also deeply into this British Israelism. They were in the same area. So all of these all these key figures that are well respected today, you're going to find them to be a part of this thing that had, you know, in its inception, it probably was not as racist as it became. But the men that came out of this that were influencing William Branham and quite literally that William Branham copied and plagiarized for his divine revelations are very, very racist people. Right. And so Wesley Swift is, everywhere he goes, he's sharing his Christian identity stuff, which is in it, which honestly, it's just another spin on British Israelism. And I have no doubt, John, and again, the histories kind of indicate all this, that when he went to these, when he went to the British Israel conferences, right, when he was preaching at Angelus Temple, where, where at a, and when he was doing his Bible studies at Angelus Temple, everything he did, he was spreading these Christian identity views as he went. This was his, this was his, his thing. And John, I, I'm not going to hold up all of the publications from these different men because they are they are, it's really evil stuff, John. It's very evil, racist stuff. Even the covers, even the pictures on the covers of their books is terrible, John. But I, I am going to just hold up one of them here. Uh, look away if you don't want to see an evil, racist image here. But I'll just hold up one one uh, picture here of the cover of their book. That way you can see it. And this is an actual copy. I have some actual copies of their books. So this tract is called The Mystery of Iniquity. This is by Wesley Swift. And as you read this track specifically, which is one of the reasons I got this one, this has serpent seed in it. It traces the genealogy to the different groups we already talked about. It's really evil, ugly stuff, and it's just a repeat of the stuff from that he learned from Philip Monson. Okay. And so, as you come into the 1930s and 1940s, Swift was actually still a teacher and a preacher at the Angelus Temple in Los Angeles. And as you come into the late 1940s and early 1950s, William Branham becomes a frequent guest at the Angelus Temple. William Branham goes there quite a lot. And Angelus Temple is really one of William Branham's key supporters going into the 1950s. And I have been able, John, just through looking at some of these different things, I can place William Branham and Wesley Swift together at Angelus Temple uh, at, at multiple times. And wow. so. We, with total certainty, William Branham uh, had at least some interaction with Wesley Swift and quite a few other people who Swift had influenced as well. 
And as time went on, again, Angelus Temple just become really, really important to William Branham. And John, one thing I think everybody knows in the message, there's a video about William Branham called 20th Century Prophet. I, I just got a little screenshot of it here. Yeah. But this video, uh, Angelus Temple was, was connected to this video that was produced. Probably right. the, after, I would say that's even probably, it's one of two videos about William Branham. That's probably the more famous of the two, the 20th Century Prophet video. And in, in that video, William Branham is being interviewed by two men. And one of those two men, Leroy Kopp, was the vice chairman at Angelus Temple, who was conducting that interview with William Branham. Yeah. There are so many, as I was going through my research, and you can find it in the book, uh, Preacher Behind the White Hoods, there's so many connections to that church. And at the time, honestly, I did not understand the full significance of it. I could see as I was researching, uh, that was in my earlier part of my research, and the book is kind of chronological, so it didn't really expand on it so much, but you've got so many connections to that church that were fundamental to William Branham's rise to fame. It's not just that he was associating with this church. This church was the one, you know, people from this church or who were influenced by this church were the ones who lifted William Branham into fame. And then when William Branham's fame began to decline, they lifted him back up again with these videos. So this is more significant, I think, than people even realize. Right. And, and Leroy Kopp from that, man, you know, from the 20th Century Prophet video, Wesley Swift was part of the same ministerial group at Angelus Temple as Leroy Cop. So Leroy Cop, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, was was well associated, well acquainted with Wesley Swift. So these connections exist, you know. And and again, I, I'm certainly not saying I know we're not saying this at all that Angelus Temple is a racist church today or anything like that. And honestly, I don't know a whole lot about them today, John, but. This stuff happened a whole long time ago before Pentecostalism had really rejected all the British Israel ideas. But it is important to know that British Israelism was born with minister in ministers associated with their church. And to me, it's important for one reason, because Christian identity theology was born out of the Pentecostal branch of British Israelism, right? And, and out of that, Wesley Swift, he actually went on and he founded his own denomination, uh, it's called the Church of Jesus Christ Christian, and it had at its peak dozens of churches all over the United States, John. And yeah, so hopefully our listeners, and especially our listeners in the message, you know, it's becoming very clear that the message is not the only place that teaches serpent seed, right? And all of these other places that teach serpent seed are deeply, deeply racist. And yeah. Quite a quite a prominent number of prominent serpent seed teachers came out of Wesley Swift's churches. Um, Arnold Murray is one of them. Uh, he's a well known preacher of serpent seed outside of the message. Uh, he's passed away now. Uh, he was a member of Wesley Swift's denomination um, before he started Shepherd's Chapel. He was actually first ordained a minister in Wesley Swift's denomination. Uh, I, I want to say in the seventies. Um, I'd, I'd have to go look that up to be sure but 70s or 80s he started out in wesley swift's denomination and then he eventually started his own church shepherd's chapel chapel he became a televangelist and he's preaching john he's preaching the serpent seed on television nationally yeah. in the united states and he and he on television connects the serpent seed just like william branham did and ends up into the jewish people right it, it's it's amazingly sad stuff and wesley swift's headquarters church john and i'm just going to show one picture of people from his headquarters church and i'll be honest finding out about his headquarters church this was actually what started me down the path of discovering the origin of serpent seed was a documentary i watched about his church um in combination with some things that my pastor started to tell me about serpent seed <laughs> but he his church, after they eventually moved to Idaho, here's a picture of a rally at his church. They eventually moved to Idaho. They renamed themselves the Aryan Nations. And this is the man right here uh, who takes over. His name's Richard Butler. He takes over as pastor after Wesley Swift dies. This church is still there in Idaho today. And there's still all kinds of churches that, that are associated with them. The Aryan Nations. This These are, these are terrible things, John. 
yeah, these are really bad people, really bad ideas, really bad ideologies, doctrines, etc. People who know me realize that I'm going to be seeing, <laughs> seeing the Nazi flag that you held up. My mind immediately goes to Colonia Dignidad because of all of the connections that we have into the Germans, the Nazis, mm -hmm. the connections to the message within. But I'm I'm being restrained because this episode we want to focus on the yeah. origins. So instead of going down that path, I'll let you guys, your minds can wander as you listen to this to the Nazi connection to the message. But think back to Roy Davis and the Klan side instead of the Nazi side. What what this thing became is purely evil. And you mentioned them, neo-Nazis, skinheads, uh, the list goes on. All of these things that we see today as purely evil, racist, terroristic organizations sprung out of this thing that William Branham was a key component for. William Branham, make no mistake, was a key component for spreading this. For the researchers who need to understand that, I've mentioned this before and I'll mention again, you have to be very meticulous in how you examine William Branham's sermons. Even in interviewing William Branham faithful, you have to be meticulous in understanding the deception that was used. William Branham did not introduce this as a racist theology on purpose. He introduced it without the racial component. He basically is stating exactly what, you know, Wesley Swift, all of these other racists were saying, took race out of it, and then followed up with other doctrines that were compounded and basically made this complex doctrine. So if you take any of the two components, you take, you know, the serpent seed and you take the high breeding doctrine. When you marry those together, you have Wesley Swift's serpent seed doctrine. And, you know, the list goes on and on. People who were in this message can probably pick up on this, but you have to you basically you have to understand the timeline of what they were trying to do, how to mass persuade the nation to become racist for the per sole purpose of fighting, you know, integration of the public school systems, etc. William Branham was a key component in that he was able to do this under the radar. People did not know that they were being convinced to be racists because he introduced it without the racial component and then followed up with the very, very racist things that combined made Wesley Swift's doctrine public. Right. And this, this is definitely where we start to bring Roy Davis back into the picture, right? Right. So remember, Roy Davis had went to prison in 1939. But as we come here into the later 1940s, Roy Davis gets out of prison. And as he gets out of prison, guess where Roy Davis moves? You and I know the answer. <laughs> Los Angeles, right, John? Exactly. Roy Davis moves to Los Angeles. And as he as he as he's doing that, as Wesley Swift is kicking off building the Christian identity theology and the Christian identity movement, as he is rising up the ranks in the KKK, Roy Davis is in L.A. at the same time. And what's Roy Davis up to in L.A., John? Maybe you talk about that. <laughs> this is the part of the show that just excites me so much. And there's just this one period of time. Uh, we're talking from 1943 to, what is it, 45 or 46. This one period of time is worthy of at least 10 episodes. So there's no way I can even possibly fit everything that happened in here. But... To give some highlights and to give some background to the listeners who may not have heard the previous episodes, um, there's some things you have to understand. Roy Davis, when he was William Branham's mentor, as he was touring, he was he had this strong, evil desire for underage women. And one of those underage women was with him at the heart of the Jeffersonville scandal that created William Branham basically established William Branham's church was um, Ali Lee Garrison, uh, Roy Davis's, um, I don't know what you call her. She was living with him as a quote unquote adopted stepchild. Oddly, while her mother knew and her mother was kind of involved with the church, she's living with Davis. Davis was a, a bigamist and she was I think he was simultaneously married to at least two other women at the same time he's with her. Yeah. So Davis, who denies all of this, denies that they're having any sexual misconduct, whisks her down to Mexico and marries her. 
emerges in California with her. And um, they had been previously touring through the United States as an act called Jack and Granny. So it was a very, very widely popular radio slash stage act where (laughs) Roy Davis and this little girl who's not supposed to be any sexual relations with him, they start out as a duo, then they get married, and now it's a this weird husband wife slash little girl act that became so popular that in 1940 uh 1943 he becomes basically that he's asked to be the mc of the equivalent of the national quartet gospel convention that we have today it's in the state of california there we learn that davis was part of one of the original founding members of the original Stamps Quartet, which blew my mind. So he is so widely popular among all of the religious people on the public side, on the private side, and under the cover of night, he is this well-known, well-respected white supremacist who was the second in command for the Ku Klux Klan. And he is... He and another figure, which I'll mention in a minute, are combining their efforts to basically create what would be and become the third wave of the Ku Klux Klan, the third pull of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, Another key figure that I'll have to mention to fully understand this is Congressman William D. Upshaw, who is widely famous in... William Branham's message cult as the guy that was healed out of the wheelchair in one of William Branham's meetings. And that meeting was in L.A. And that meeting was in L.A., um, who, you know, I mentioned did not need a wheelchair and had not since the early 1900s. Um, right. And his he actually was interviewed by the L.A. Times after he was supposedly healed. And he confessed to the newspaper reporters that he could already walk after and 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 William Branham when he did this he told us over and over again he told us he had been crippled for 66 years yes. congressman upshaw was crippled for 66 years he was a total invalid that's a direct quote right but he wasn't <laughs> but he wasn't <laughs> he could already walk before he even got to the to the Ange- to the where the revival was and he was and he was healed right. supposedly to be able to walk so again just one more incredibly suspect <laughs> miracle that William Branham performed, where the story, certainly what he told us as, a, as the crowd, was not true. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying real hard because it's hard to contain all of this into <laughs> one short summary. I, if you go to my website and you go, you know, search for William D. Upshaw in the newspapers, just type running, you'll find that not only was he not crippled and not in a wheelchair, he was caught physically running, using his crutches, just lightly touched him to the ground. It, it was an obvious prop, the crutches were. He had not needed them. I want to say it was 19 and 1915 or 1905. The, the date slips my mind, but he was out of yeah. the wheelchair long, long before William Branham ever, you know, saw him as a quote-unquote patient in a healing revival. The other congressmen in Congress realized he didn't really need his crutches at a certain point, and yeah. they they started accusing him that he was just using the crutches as part of his costume to help him win votes or you know elicit sympathy for votes. Right, and again, he's another one. We could do ten episodes on him. Yeah. People ask, and he's connected to the Klan. He's connect- Yeah, so I was I was trying to get there, but I there's so many interesting facts. So much Pe- stuff. People ask. Well, people say to me, well, there's no way that he would have pretended to be a crippled and need a, you know these crutches all his life. There's no way he would do this. But you have to understand that was a part of his stage persona. He was a very very famous writer. His accident ma- turned basically that was what lifted him into popularity was that he had this accident and he, God was working with him. Everybody had this sympathy for him for his entire life. That was his stage act. He had the crutches. He had, They actually would carry him to the stage in a wheelchair, but he would stand up out of it. He, um, you know, it was just, it was part of the act. But anyway, that aside, he was the Klan's key component in Washington in the early 19, basically from its inception until 19, 
what was it, 1922, 23, whenever the Klan imploded, he is the one who defended William Joseph Simmons, the founder of the Klan, in Washington, D.C. William D. Upshaw um, was his defense. And Roy E. Davis was with Upshaw and Simmons as they were building out the Klan. Davis mentioned that in a later article that he helped write the constitution of the Klan and the bylaws, etc. So you've got Davis and Simmons who were part of the original unit that formed the Klan. They started this orphanage scheme in California to start funding the third wave of the Klan. And they um, basically, in the trial aftermath that followed, Davis posed as a federal agent, William Upshaw, presented him as such and and basically davis is violating all kinds of laws he has a weapon which was illegal for him at the time uh, upshaw introduces him to a very prominent figure a uh, mrs usher who's a very wealthy uh, lady and anyway long story short the two decide to build this orphanage and um Upshaw becomes the head of this Department of Americanization in the orphanage. And the Klan's agenda was basically that America was becoming un-Americanized. So you had all of these very prominent white supremacy figures who were trying to Americanize the nation. So they create an orphanage, and they say that they have a Department of Americanization. And during this time... Los Angeles had this large influx of orphans from the wars, from the, um, you know, there's different genocides being enacted in other nations. You had this influx of orphans in, in the state at the time. So they're going to Americanize the orphans, basically. And uh, long story short, they end up getting caught and the scheme is basically they found that they were taking all of the money that that the donors were donating to the orphanage and they had two sets of log books of uh, accounting books and upshaw helped keep the other accounting records if i understood the newspaper artist correctly and basically on the on the books the money was going to the orphanage off the books they were funding some unknown thing, which we find later was the Klan. So again, that's a broad sweeping, not even skimming the surface summary of what's going on, but you kind of get the picture. Roy Davis is in LA, the same time Wesley Swift's doing all of this stuff, running a financial scheme to basically embezzle money through this orphanage charity um, and collect money through this orphanage charity to send money to the clan yeah right so this is definitely happening there in that time frame and and i think it's also worth noting john um that at the same time that this orphanage is being built in the la area that roy davis and upshaw is involved in this is the same time that the sharon orphanage is being built in skaskatchewan where latter rain is going to happen yes and that that orphanage again we know through through different histories that they were being financially sponsored by Angelus Temple as well. So Sharon Orphanage had Angelus Temple. And uh, I just point out too, and we'll we'll get to this clearly at some point, George Houghton was a British Israelite. Mm-hmm. And George Houghton also believed and taught this racial serpent seed Christian identity stuff himself throughout the majority of his life. So there is all of these interesting things happening in all these places. And and another thing to mention, so when William Branham was at that meeting in L.A. and Congressman Upshaw comes to be healed, William Branham tells us on tape that Roy Davis is the person who sent Upshaw to his meeting, right? So so again, we, we have a lot of indicators that William Branham is connected back to Roy Davis. There's at least some kind of communications happening between them. Um, As you come into the early 1950s, you know, 1951, 1952, 1953, there is some channel of communications happening between William Branham and Roy Davis because William Branham on tape is telling us stuff that Roy Davis told him in, in recent times. So 
Something's going on here. I think here's where you begin to understand that there was more to William Branham's rise to fame than just pure accident. This was a planned strategy. And without diving too deep into the conspiracy, which is very easy to do with all of these facts, if you just look at the key players, the one, William Branham would not be famous if not for the Sharon Orphanage. The Sharon Orphanage basically went all across Canada with him, and they're basically creating such a hype on William Branham in Canada that William Branham comes back to the United States as a famous key figure in early Pentecostalism. And if not for these guys, that would never have happened. And you've got him connected to Gordon Lindsay, who, like you said, is connected to all of this stuff. You've got the key figures in the Angelus Temple who are helping sponsor him. And this seems to be where the racism is originating, at least with regards to William Branham's own doctrine. He is, he's being, I want to say, you know, without, again, without using conspiracy theory thought, it looks as though he's being manipulated and controlled by these figures. It does not look like William Branham is the mastermind, which I, for years I thought, well, he, he was just way smarter than he was. He was just a person, he was a tool that was used by these people to basically become the public face to those who were skeptical of the white supremacy doctrine. William Branham became the public face as a quote-unquote non-white supremacist to help establish the white supremacy doctrine for these people. And I think we can say that pretty clearly without any conspiracy thought. Right. You know, when when I look at all the facts and evidence around William Branham's connections to all these white supremacist figures in all these years, and we've got more to talk about in this episode. There's a whole lot we haven't even mentioned yet. <laughs> um, to me, there's a whole lot of, of gray in there, right? Yeah. We, we know the connections exist, but I'm still left with a whole lot of questions about things I'll never know. What was going on in William Branham's mind? Um, as all this unfolds, right? Right. But one thing I'm certainly comfortable in saying is that William Branham clearly had clan figures and white supremacist influenced people around him through these years. And as you come into the, the 1950s, right, to some extent, I, I think it's very safe for us to say that William Branham was, at least to some extent, influenced by these white supremacist ideas yeah. his ideology was to some extent influenced by these men that is beyond a shadow of a doubt true and because as time goes on william Branham becomes more and more openly racial in his sermons and by the time you get to the little rock nine protest john william Branham publicly endorses segregation right he says um he says well i don't believe in slavery but god is a segregationist and every Christian should be a segregationist, too. He says things like that by the time you're getting into the mid and late 50s. Yeah. And by the time you get to 1958, William Branham is finally publicly teaching Serpent Seed. And Serpent Seed really becomes a key teaching throughout the rest of his life and, and coincides, you know, as we, as, we de as we dive into some future episodes, it's going to coincide with William Branham becoming ostracized and, and marginalized. Yeah. In the Little Rock Nine incident that you mentioned is very, very critical to understanding all of this. You have to understand, when we think of the Ku Klux Klan today, we think of all the photographs we see of all of these big circles of people in white robes and a burning cross, and they're out in a kind of a public field and a very, very open thing. When you see those photographs, you're not seeing this era. You're seeing the early 19, you know, 1920s, 20s, early 30s. 1930s. After approximately 19, I can't remember the, the event. It was probably D.C. Stevenson's fall. The Klan was deeply scarred. They had to go underground. Basically, they were almost non-existent. But all of the white supremacist leaders who were backing all of this were not non-existent, nor did their ideology suffer. So they basically all went underground and they... Hiding out into church in Jeffersonville, some of them. <laughs> some of them. They, they basically went underground and covertly established organizations such as 
orphanages. I mean, if you go look through just some, read any history book on this era, you'll find that like the Louisiana Rifle Association was the front for Roy E. Davis's clan, the Louisiana Rifle Association. You had orphanages, you had preschool type things, things that you would never associate with white supremacy. That's how these guys hid. One of them, they were certain like women's aid societies. Yes. Right? I, I've read of it. Like it, it's crazy. Some of the stuff they put up as fronts on their uh, on, which was which was really just the clan. Yeah. Is what it was. So, what's what's happening here in Little Rock? You have to understand Little Rock. If you want to understand William Branham's deeper, darker secrets, you must understand Little Rock. What happened? Because in Little Rock, Arkansas, this is basically the event where William Branham transitions from a white supremacist in hiding to a very open white supremacist in his circles of people who were also working with him and understood white supremacy. Now, he also has sermons after this where all the white supremacy doctrines are scrubbed and they're very public and they're he's speaking to people that would just be appalled if he said these things. So if you search the timeline after this event, you're going to find both. You'll find him supporting the segregation of races and you'll find him saying that anyone who supports the segregation of races is evil. You're going to, you're going to find both in his sermons, but in little rock, Arkansas, the United States, had uh, Congress pass this law that the entire nation had to racially integrate all their schools. And Little Rock, Arkansas, blatantly refused. We are not going to do this. And it became such a such a scar in American history. There were nine students who were black who decided we will not bow to these people, these white supremacists. We're going to school. And the United States military basically had to help these children in because all of Little Rock was so violently against the black people attending schools. That's how bad this was. The The matter made it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court basically said, this school must integrate. They cannot, they cannot be separated racially. What happened was the... Uh, the people in Little Rock, basically the white supremacists were in control of the city. They said, no, we will not integrate. And they stood to banded together and they voted whether or not they would agree to the Supreme Court's ruling. And it was widely overruled in Little Rock. So they said, we will not racially integrate. That happened the day before William Branham openly introduced his serpent seed this actually the sermon entitled serpent seed came right after this ruling so he is basically standing up in support of these white supremacists in arkansas remember the clan is underground they're working under different um you know different covert operations names etc there were federal agents who were in Little Rock planted as posing as white supremacists. And I'm pulling up a office, and you have it here, an office memorandum to the director of the FBI. So this is, this matter made it all the way to the top. And the original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, that is Roy Davis and William Upshaw's organization, the original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, that was formerly the U.S. Klans, the formerly of Texas, etc. The federal agent who's posing as a white supremacist was able to actually get a list of names that were members of the organization throughout Arkansas and Texas and identify the key figures in those two states. And what they found was that in Little Rock, and I'll read it here, all of the individuals listed at Little Rock are known to be members of the captioned organization, which is the original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, at Little Rock with the exception of one person on page three. So the entire list of people were members of Roy Davis's organization. Right. And Roy Davis is listed by name as Imperial Grand Dragon, national leader of the Klan in this. This is one of the FBI's declassified official records of what was going on at Little Rock Nine. So 
Roy Davis and, and the Klan, and as leader of the Klan, was orchestrating a whole lot of things happening in these Little Rock Nine protests. And here's the thing, too, John. We can place Wesley Swift at the Little Rock Nine protests. Um, and Wesley Swift was there. He There were hooded Klansmen at these protests. And one of the hooded Klansmen at those protests was Wesley Swift. Um, <clears throat> we have that through multiple sources, and Wesley Swift confirmed it himself. And and that exact same time frame is when William Branham is coming out and saying, I don't believe in slavery, but God is a segregationist, and you need to be a segre- all Christians need to be segregationists. This is the same time that William Branham is starting to preach this stuff. This yeah. is the same time that William Branham is bringing out serpent seed doctrine publicly for the first time, right? It's right here in this window that Roy Davis is masterminding the Little Rock Nine protest stuff wesley swift is there too and william branham is starting to publicly preach this racial stuff really for the first time yeah it's all happening at the same time and another interesting fact if you just do a search in william branham's transcripts for roy davis remember he's separated from davis for this time period of time when davis was in prison william branham basically rose up to fame overnight and I think it went to his head but after Davis sends the letter to Gordon Lindsay exposing his entire life story as a as a fraud basically William Branham seems to come back to Davis and if you do a search for Roy Davis in the transcripts you'll find that as this event was happening as Davis was basically rising up to be the imperial wizard the key figure, the the leader of the original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, that's when William Branham heavily starts name dropping Davis. And you'll find him making statements like Roy Davis. Many of you know him. He is basically advertising his connection to the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, it's something else. And you know, the evidence is all there for anybody who wants to take the time and look at it. You know, of course, where we come from, John, oh, this is all crazy. No, this is not crazy. <laughs> this this is the truth. This is yeah. what really happened. William Branham got serpent seed from these people. He got some of these things he taught to us and told us it was divine revelation from God, from these people, and he taught it to us, and, 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 and we believe this stuff in the message. And, you know, politically, the KKK and the Christian Identity Movement, their two main goals were, one, they were militantly opposed to interracial marriage, just like William Branham was, and two, they were in favor of racial segregation, just like William Branham was, right? That's what they were fighting over. That's what the protests were about. That's That was the main subject of their speeches. And when you look at those two issues, William Branham was publicly and vocally supporting the white supremacist position on those two things in the 1950s at the same time, you know, that, that the Klan and Christian identity was. William Branham told his audiences, God's a segregationist. You need to be a segregationist. All Christians are segregationists. He said that multiple times, John, across. He didn't just say that once. He said that multiple times across quite a number of sermons um, throughout his life after the after this stuff, after he got involved again in this stuff. And we're going to have to deep dive into some of this in future episodes, but it really does coincide. This coincides with William Branham being ostracized from... Um, really the rest of Pentecostalism and becoming marginalized. It was not yet a cohesive union of white supremacists. Even though Davis was the imperial wizard and there was a original Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, it was not, it, it was not cohesive with the United States, when uh, white supremacists in the United States. When you think of the Klan, you think of one organized unit. But remember, they had to splinter, they had to go into hiding, so you had all these little groups, and it was like, this white supremacist whack-a-mole. You could whack one group out and another would would pop up. One of the more interesting ones that popped up was the National States Rights Party sprung up right after, um, you know, as this battle is going on in Little Rock and after the Little Rock basically rose up in defiance of the, the United States um, Supreme Court. And, National States Rights Party popped up and they had a P.O. box that was Post Office Box 261, Jeffersonville, Indiana. That's William Branham's hometown, Jeffersonville. Yeah. What's really interesting about that National States Rights Party, too, John, Oren Petito, 
who was the key leader in that was the chief lieutenant of Wesley Swift. Yes. Right. So, and, and they're operating out of Jeffersonville. You know, it, it's, it's odd, isn't it, John? Just it, it, there's so many odd things here that it just makes you wonder what exactly is going on here. And I, I would like to take just a minute to analyze William Branham's Serpency teachings and, and just kind of show how it relates back to British Israelism and the Christian identity movement. And um, <clears throat> I'll just read two quotes here. Let me take one. This is from the very first time, I'm going to read this one, the very first time that William Branham on tape publicly signaled that he believed in Serpent Seed. And it's not 1958, actually. It's 1954. Right, the first time that William Branham actually shares serpent seed that he believes it on tape is 1954, and I don't think he's being recorded when he says this, John. This might be someone in the audience with the tape. It might be one of these tapes that found it in the library. He says here, I'm just going to read a quote. It's 1954, questions and answers number one, William Branham. He says, now here's a little doctrine of my own now. It's just church folks, see? Right? I don't think he thought he was being recorded. Yeah. He says, and I'm just going to read, he says, I think that Cain was the son of Satan. Right? So he's, he's teach, he's privately telling this in 1954. And just noticed how he said that, right? It, it's, it's very clear he's, he feels like, well, I'm pr in private with my inner crowd and I'm just going to tell you my little secret doctrine now, right? And you know, John, that is exactly how the racial components of Serpent Seed are shared where I come from, right? It, it's a private little thing. It's not something that, that really is done publicly. And this really sh gives us a, an insight into William Branham was not preaching the serpent seed stuff to his big crowds, but he was teaching it privately years before he ever preached it publicly in 1958. And um, anyways, he says there that he believes Cain was the son of Satan, right? Which is exactly out of British Israelism, is exactly out of Christian identity theology. And what's interesting, John, here is, you know, when he starts working with Jim Jones, those are the years that he publicly denies Serpent Seed, right? Yes, that's a big deal. In the years before he's working with Jim Jones, we have quotes like that, he publicly believes Serpent Seed, but when he starts working with Jim Jones, and Jim Jones was all about racial equality, right? Yeah. Once we get to the point that he's working with Jim Jones, that's when the quotes come out that um, Adam and Eve are the mother of all living, right? <laughs> he he backtracks it, right? Yeah. So he believes serpent seed, then he don't believe serpent seed, then he believes it again. So again, we just have to conclude that those quotes where he's saying, where he did not denounce a serpent seed, he was, he was just trying to appeal to the audience of that day, which at that point in time, he was working with Jim Jones. And I'll mention there, he literally had to work with Jim Jones. His ministry was imploding. And Jim Jones and Joseph Matson Bose, we'll we'll get into this and I'm just aching to get there. So yeah. I'll, I'll give you the I don't highlights. want to spoil our, our next few episodes. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to spoil it. But uh Jones was well, well recognized, uh, even somewhat nationally recognized as being an open um civil rights leader. He he w loved the equality of black people and white people. He loved supporting them. His church had several key figures that were black. <clears throat> and you have to understand, whenever I've heard black men defend the racist things that William Branham said, and in their defense they say, well, I'm black. I, I know friends that were with William Branham were black. But look at the key figures in the message look at the men who were in William Branham's inner circle and you won't find one single person with black skin. You look at the cover of the voice of healing when they have all hundred right. evangelists. How many of them are black? Zero. There right. is not one black minister in the voice of healing fellowship. Not yeah. One. What happened with, you know, again, it's a very, very covert operation. And if you examine any of the ministries of men who were not racist, you're going to find deacons, evangelists, ministers. You're going to find, look at their photographs. I just recently went to Mishawaka, which was one of the well-respected, uh, openly e 
preaching equality churches in the United States, and you look at their photographs, you're going to find black people, white people, you're going to find black leaders in the church, white people, very, very open, openly integrated. But if you examine any of not just William Branham, any of the white supremacy churches, you will find black people in their church who aren't aware that they're being discriminated against. And they're also not aware that these are white supremacy leaders. And what happens is the white supremacists purposefully don't kick them out because it's like the old saying goes, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. They want to control, manipulate, If a black person is in the church of a white supremacist, the white supremacist will try to influence that black person to influence other black people. So their doctrines are going to change. They're not going to openly say, I am a white supremacist and I think you are, (laughs) I think you are less than me. I'm laughing and that's an awful thing. I, I realize, but it's, it's just really, when you take a step back, it's just so funny, stupid that these men were doing this. This is how these men operated. And honestly, I denied it. Even after I discovered that William Branham was working with the Imperial wizard, I denied that this was a thing because I was raised to deny it. But when you understand the entire history, there is no denying it. William Branham was using his platform, his fame, his, his position as leader of the healing revival to influence white people to join into the white supremacy ideologies. Yeah. Let let me take one more excerpt out of the Serpent Seed Sermon and just point out what William Branham is saying here. This is from his 1958 sermon on Serpent Seed. William Branham is tracing the genealogy of the Serpent Seed in this quote. He says, Notice this now. And out of there then came Ham, Ham with his wife, and them, he had a curse put on him, right? And, you know, according to the Bible, Ham is the biblical father of the African peoples, right? I mean, there, there's no question. You read the Bible, Ham's descendants populated Africa, right? And just like British Israelism, William Branham is connecting the Africans to the serpent seed in his sermon on serpent seed. But look here at this next statement, what he goes on to say here, Here he goes beyond British Israelism and he moves into Christian identity. The next sentence he says, From Ham came Nimrod who built Babylon. And out of Babylon came the Catholic Church, the beginning of it. So here he has moved into Christian identity theology. That's Philip Monson. That's Wesley Swift stuff right there. But William Branham don't stop there when he's tracing the serpent seed lineage. Look what he does next. He says, Come on down through Ahab, King Ahab of Israel. Come on down through Ahab. That was Jezebel's husband. Come on down through Ahab. Come on down from Ahab into Judas Iscariot. Wound up the Antichrist. William Branham, in his sermon on Serpent Seed, traces the genealogy of the Serpent Seed just like Christian identity theology. Yeah. He came through Ham. He went to Nimrod, Babylon, the Catholic Church. And then he comes down to King Ahab, into the Jewish people, down to Judas Iscariot, to the Antichrist. I mean, he, this is exactly what Christian identity theology teaches. William Branham is just leaving out the words black and Jew, John. That is it. And where I come from, uh, the preachers will tell us this stuff publicly, and not publicly, but privately. And they will tell us exactly what William Branham told them privately. And maybe in our next episode we can get into some of that. But, you know, I I think it's very clear here. I mean, in this sermon, William Branham is undeniably tracing the serpent seed to Africans, Jews, and the Catholic Church. Yeah. And he just does it without using the word black or Jew. Whereas Christian identity theology is very very free in using those two words. But, But the implications are exactly the same. And... I don't even think, honestly, you have to go to the private teachings to see that William Branham was making this thing racial. I, it was racial in the public teaching. Yeah. He just omitted those two words. The problem, I think, people who are in the message, they kind of just accept everything as 
as it's stated, and they really don't critically think about what's being said. So William Branham is saying exactly what the white supremacists are saying in this sermon. He's preaching exactly the serpent seed. He's taken the name or the word black and the word Jew out of it. <clears throat> but he is, again, he's saying exactly what these people are saying. And unless you, unless you just really think about what he's teaching, it's going to completely go under the radar. But remember the timeline. He's making this sermon the very day that newspapers from coast to coast, we're talking, I don't know how many thousands of newspapers, basically announce to the nation that Little Rock is standing up against the United States government and will not integrate the school system. The white supremacists have now gained the upper hand. That is the day, the very day that William Branham basically takes his white supremacy doctrine that he'd had covertly in hiding, and he openly says, I support the Little Rock because I'm preaching this Christian identity doctrine. Yeah, you know, it, it's something else. And, you know, for me, John, the ultimate smoking gun that William Branham was influenced by white supremacists is the serpent seed doctrine, right? Yeah. Serpent seed came from these white supremacist ideology. It was a racist ideology from its days in British Israelism. And William Branham's sermons on this topic show a clear influence from Christian identity beliefs. And, you know, when you couple that up with the fact that he was acquainted with Wesley, Wesley Swift, he was ordained a minister by Roy Davis, it just, it paints a picture. William Branham was at the very least, a man deeply influenced by the white supremacists of his days. And, you know, we're not we're not the only ones saying this. People have been saying this, John, for over 30 years, yeah. right? And and the original way that the people arrived this wasn't by discovering that he was uh, ordained by the imperial wizard of the clan, but was through serpent seed. Serpent seed. People, if you look at Michael Barcoon's book, you will find that he is speculating that there has to be a white supremacist connection to William Branham you know, decades ago. Yeah. He just can't quite place it. But Serpent Seed is the smoking gun evidence that William Branham was connected to white supremacy. The other thing I'd like to point out, I get this comment, I, I can't tell you how many hundred times that I've got this comment that why didn't people rise up against William Branham during his lifespan? Why why are we doing this now? Why why not while he was alive? But if you look on the recorded sermons they also make this argument against me. They say, well, William Branham stood against hundreds of ministers who rose up against him, and they backed down. What they're hearing and what they're saying is exactly what William Branham gave as his version of the story. That event where hundreds of ministers rose up against him, William Branham also said because it was he was teaching serpent seed. So hundreds of ministers rose in opposition to William Branham because of this very sermon where he's basically taking Wesley Swift's doctrine and he's making Wesley Swift's doctrine public among all of his followers in the healing revivals. That's why hundreds of ministers rose up against William Branham. Right. And I look forward into getting into those episodes when all of this unfolds because these men who rose up against him understood what he was saying, right? Whereas in the message, there is a there's a disconnect between what William Branham is is saying and what what he means, right? It's right. like they don't they don't we don't didn't grasp it, but hopefully we're connecting the dots here for people. So, you know, one thing I do wonder about William Branham, John, I wonder if his white supremacist views were his true deeply held beliefs or were they just what he was saying to appeal to certain audiences, right? Because we know his track record was that he was kind of a chameleon. He just changed his beliefs to fit the audience he is speaking to. And so part of me wonders if that's what was going on here. You know, was 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 the William Branham who preached equality the real William Branham? Or was the William Branham who preached segregation the real William Branham? Because like literally everything else, he preached this topic multiple ways, and, and, and it leaves a little bit of a question in my mind as to who was the real William Branham. But I, I have to say, for me personally, I lean towards the segregationist William Branham being the real, real William Branham. Yeah. It's hard historically because 
to show something as, as historically ac- accurate, you have to have some form of evidence, some documentation. <clears throat> and what we need to understand about William Branham for his own personal views, since he's dead and he cannot speak for himself, is what did he do when he was not in his stage persona? What, what was his life like outside of the stage persona? I can mention things that my grandfather said about William Branham and some of the jokes that he told. And I could use those as evidence that William Branham was a white supremacist very easily. Uh, these, these were terrible, terrible jokes that I grew up in. They were part of my life. I mean, it, it's horrific, Charles. But that's not historical record. That's hearsay because my grandfather heard William Branham making a horrific racist joke. So I can't use that as evidence. What we can say is that off the record, off the stage act, off of the recordings, we find the statements like was made to Lee Vale about the serpent being black as the ace of spades or to Raymond Jackson. We've got the sermon and I'll try to link it here in the description if I don't forget about Raymond Jackson you know, basically taking the serpent seed lineage and expanding upon William Branham's private racial teachings. This was his offstage personality that was racist. There is no question in my mind. But historically, the only two pieces of evidence that I can use are the Lee Vale sermon and the, um, you know, the Raymond Jackson sermon. Yeah. You know, one last important thing, I think, before we wrap up this this episode is I just want to remake the point that these racial serpent seed ideas were present at the latter rain movement from very early on, right? Yeah. Um, George Houghton, he is the leader at North Battleford where latter rain begins, and he's the lead elder there. And he is deeply, deeply a believer in British Israelism from, from the start of this thing. And he publicly taught the fully racial version of serpent seed. And, you know, and it's not to say that all of the latter rain sects, John, um, not all of the latter rain sects were accepting of this, but a lot of them did. Several of our cousin branches out of latter rain um, also believed in serpent seed. Here is here is a, you know, the book that George Houghton published on the topic. Here's, you know, public apologies in the late 80s. He preached this, John, all the way up through the late 80s, you know, after he's done been um, excommunicated from North Battleford, and he's more or less joined in with, with the message for the rest of his life. We, George Houghton was touring, John, with Perry Green while he was preaching this kind of stuff, right? So, I mean, we can, we have, this stuff touches every significant sect of the early message. We can put this racial serpent seed teaching with Perry Green and his group, right? Through George Houghton. We can put it with Lee Vale and his his group. We can put it with Raymond Jackson and, and that sect. We can put it with um, all these different ones. We can connect it. We know Ewald Frank had it through Cacao Philippe, who still preaches it today, right? Um, you know, on and on it goes, you bear witness. It was in the main sect, right? So it's not just one or two isolated groups where this thing was being taught in this racial way. Every significant sect of the message, as you come after William Branham's death in the 60s and into the early 70s, seems to have been teaching this fully racial version of serpent seed, right? And it seems to be somewhat private, somewhat behind the scenes. And when they're confronted and caught over it, they're embarrassed. They apologize. They pretend like they never preached it, right? And the same thing today. You know, as, as some of this stuff's been coming out, John, I know some of the message leaders are in full cover-up mode right now. Oh, yeah. Trying to say that this stuff never happened. But they are lying. It absolutely was. It absolutely is. I, as a message minister, received private instruction in this stuff personally from ministers who personally received it from William Branham okay I know what I'm talking about I know what I heard I know what I was told and I know what this evidence all points to this is the truth I don't think I've ever publicly mentioned to this I think I've mentioned it to you Charles but I actually get more criticism from men who have left the message than I do from people who are in the message. I get attacked so heavily from people who have left. The number one thing that I get attacked for is this. 
They all want to deny this racist thing. i never forget when I first published the information that Roy Davis was the Imperial Wizard. I was attacked so heavily that I, I actually walked away from my website. I told you, shared that with you. I've not shared it with many people. The, if you go back and you look at the old, um, <clears throat> you go back and look at the old blog, you'll find that there's a period of time I handed my website over, over to another lady and she basically was running everything. She was doing the videos and everything because the attack was so significant from men who did not want me to share the racist stuff. Even still today, I, I, I hate to say this and I'll publicly say it. I've, I've tried to walk away from this many, many times because I, I actually would rather not be doing this, but I don't know of anybody else who will stand and share this information. This was a racist movement. There is no question about it. This was purely evil. It was purely against all the Christian moral code. This was the most vile, evil thing that has been in the nation. And think of the consequences of this. You cannot say that every group that splintered from this is a racist movement. You cannot say that. But what you can say is that every key figure who was deeply connected to William Branham that created a movement, they all knew it. They were all involved. Think of T.L. Osborne. T.L. Osborne, who basically said that William Branham was God at William Branham's funeral. T.L. Osborne is the one who gave William Branham the, st the slave statue that we've mentioned in his den. That's, that's mentioned openly by the cult. These men knew that William Branham was racist. And like T.L. Osborne, who he became basically the face of the Trinity Broadcasting Network. T.L. Osborne himself was participating in this, giving William Branham the most evil looking display of I, I just, I don't even want to say it, man. This is, this is so, so bad. This was a gift from Tommy Osborne in 1959. He brought that back to Kenya. It was hand carved over there by one of the natives. And Brother Ram talks about it on a couple different tapes. On one of them, he says this man took a, a vow to his God not to speak. And he says, how many Christians have a similar dedication to your God? And all of these men want to cover this up and say that it did not happen. But I'm here to tell you, and I'm sharing the documents with you, this happened. Absolutely, John. Absolutely. And as it relates to the present day in the message, you know, this stuff, you know, what we're talking about is 50, 60 years ago. Today and for the past number of years, a lot of people in the message are totally oblivious to this history. They have no idea. They have no idea serpent seed came from white supremacy. They have no idea this history of stuff. And there is a whole lot of people in the message who are absolutely oblivious to this stuff. Um, and there's even preachers in there, I believe, who, who do not know and did not know what serpent seed was about. I didn't know for a time. There, there was a point in time which I was filled in by the upper leadership on what this stuff meant. And up until then, I didn't really know. And it's that way with a lot of people. A lot of people don't know, but a whole lot of people do know that this stuff is fully racial, right? So look at the facts. Dear audience, dear audience, look at the facts, especially my friends in the message. Please look at the facts and wake up. For God's sake, wake up. Yeah. Well, Charles, there's so much here. I'm kind of sad this episode is coming to a close. There's so much I want to talk about. I, I think I counted 15 different sideshows that I want to do <laughs> just revolving around this one thing. Roy Davis alone, I, I could, uh, 15 is a low number. There's at least 20 <laughs> that we should do on Roy Davis. But if you've enjoyed our show and you want more information, you can check us out on the web. You can find us at william-branham.org and christiangospelchurch.org. For an overview of the historical research of William Branham and the healing revivals, read Preacher Behind the White Hoods, a critical examination of William Branham and his message, available on Amazon, Kindle, and Audible. Join us again next week. We've got a great episode coming. 